So, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, this Look. is, um, we, as you know, our organization is uh, designed to help members develop a better understanding about how they're joining and engaging more regularly with the water level issue on the Great Lakes can have an impact on the decision-making process around the issue. With your experience as Mayor of Toronto, you're uniquely qualified to reflect on this topic. If it's all right with you, let's begin at a high level and move towards the more specific. So first question uh, would be, what does public engagement mean to you? Well, for me, there's a very important distinction between engaging people and consulting with them. So as a government, consulting with people means you take out a, a, a position paper or a document to people and, and ask for their opinion, uh, which is fine. Uh, but from my perspective, engaging people is a much stronger and more meaningful thing to do. Public engagement, to me, means people have ownership over the issue and they make the decisions. Um, and so, for example, if you were developing a new policy, you'd work directly with people um, and their input would help shape the policy before you've even committed to it. So I think in the case of a nonprofit organization, it's the same kind of thing. You want people to be engaged at the grassroots level, to be working together um, through the nonprofit to achieve a particular result. Okay. Um, how does public engagement bear or have an impact on political decision making? Public engagement is incredibly important and very influential in political decision making. You know, when people speak up collectively, they have a very strong voice and politicians will listen. You know, there's rules of thumb, like if you get one email, there's a hundred people thinking about it, those sorts of things. Um, and elected officials pay attention to that sometimes, but what they really are impressed with is when people are very organized, they've got clear positions, they're, they've thought about those positions. Um, and so they're, they're both factual and, and reasonable as a result uh, and principled um, and it's very important in the decision making process. So if people are engaged and working together, uh, they can make very significant change. In fact, I don't think sometimes people realize how powerful they are. Okay. Um, it would help if you could give us some examples of specifically how it happens by perhaps describing one or two cases in the past you're involved in where public engagement sort of showed up in the middle of a decision? Well, I think if, if you look at a number of uh, political issues um, from, you know, in Toronto's case, uh, there's been a debate about Toronto Island airports since the 1930s. And you know, the airports on Toronto Island, which is um, a park except for the airport, uh, with a small residential community that keeps it safe, it's a, it's a real gem. And whenever this issue really heats up, people organize, and it's not just the downtown residents, it's people all over Toronto. And we've seen the results in my own political career, where people spoke up very strongly about the proposed bridge that was going to lead to airport expansions. So that's one example. Now, that's, how, how did they speak up? How did they show up? So people organized, they got engaged together, um, they had a, what we would think of today as a virtual community. All this was 10 years ago, so mm -hmm. the technology was, was a little bit different. Uh, but they organized through email, they took a common position, um, they then uh, tried to influence the political process with their common position. Some people agreed with them, some didn't. It actually became the defining issue in the 2003 mayoral election because a bridge was going to be built that would have had very significant environmental impacts, would have uh, hurt the uh, passive use for recreation of the waterfront, like sailing, for example, and would have significantly inhibited uh, the development of the waterfront, which is an economic goal of the City of Toronto, and people organized themselves um, and, and then spoke up. And what I thought was important about that as an example is the organization, the fact that it was grassroots, the fact it came from people, and the fact that they took a very principled but clear and simple and scientifically supportable position. And I think when you have that combination, it's a very powerful uh, political force. Um, what are the different modes of showing up, appearing in public life that public can, can well, do? So the, the question was, what does showing up mean? Yes, where, in what physically life? does it actually make happen? It, well, it means lots of things. Showing up can mean sending an email to a, a member of parliament or a member of provincial parliament saying, I'm really concerned about this issue. 
Showing up can mean coming to a public meeting and demonstrating physically with your presence. Showing up can mean in the context of an election, being involved with a group of people who are organizing around an issue, not around a party. You know, in a party election, you want all the parties to support your issue in an ideal world. Uh, it can mean any of those things and more. But it, what I mean by showing up is taking an action. Okay. And uh, one of the, the great things about organizing is w once you've organized enough people, um, not everybody has to be out at the public meeting, although it's good if you have a really good turnout, that matters. But if you've got people organized and there's lots of other people who can do something else who can't quite come to the meeting, it's maybe too far away, but can be involved by email, letter, you know, telephoning, all sorts of other things. That's showing up to me means all of those. Uh, there's another good, ex an ample, another example of successful public engagement come to mind in terms of its political impact? Yeah, it's a, it's a very simple example, but uh, the, the early in my political career, there was a proposal to widen Eglinton Avenue, and the people didn't want it. And probably if people hadn't organized, it would have gone through. Uh, because the local councillor at the time was um, of the mind that if you widen roads, it's better for cars, therefore better for people. The studies nowadays show it's not true. Um, that actually doesn't solve congestion problems. You need, you need to solve it in other ways, like building public transit. And people organized incredibly. And they had uh, signs on their lawns, they had petitions. Um, you know, this was in about 1995, so the use of right. computers and virtual is much less. But they got a, a huge crowd out at the relevant public meetings and then at the relevant meeting where people voted. They had hundreds and hundreds of people send letters and phone calls to the politicians. Um, and, and what they were organizing around from their perspective was a simple principle. You know, we don't want a road to be widened, so in effect it's a highway running through the middle of our residential neighborhood. We'd like the road to remain the size of a road that, although busy, still befits a residential neighborhood. And it was, it was a, a good principle and they were clear about it um, and reasoned and science-based um, and very, very organized. They got thousands and thousands of people. Not everybody came to the public meeting, not everybody came to council, uh, but everybody did something from signing a petition to making a phone call and it worked. It was really effective. Your emphasis on organization suggests or leads me to wonder what you felt about the uh, that uh, show up uh, Wall Street, uh, off Wall Street movement, where they were all uh, taking over St. James Park. Um, you know what I mean by that? I'm trying to think of the word. Occupy. Well, Occupy. Occupy Wall Street was very interesting because people self organized who otherwise wouldn't be engaged in politics. And it had a very big impact in the big picture because people are now talking about issues like income inequality where they hadn't been for 20 years. But where it didn't succeed was in the end there wasn't a clear ask or science-based or fact-based um, uh, result that they wanted. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, you know, the organizing, uh, whether you agree with it or not, is not the point. But as a case of organizing, it was pretty remarkable. And they got people all around the world to pay attention to, to the issue of income inequality. I think it would have been even more effective had they managed to organize people who weren't camping out in parks, but maybe are in office towers like the one we're in, right. but have some sympathy on this issue. Um, and to get those people engaged, you, you probably had to have a clear ask. And maybe the clear ask would be, you know, a higher minimum wage or you know, poverty alleviation measures or higher taxes for the rich or whatever public right. policy issue was going to be, um, they might have been able to, to spread it more. I still think they had a big impact, mm -hmm. but it's an interesting example of how you, you need to do more than just organize. You have to organize around a, a principle or a point. Good, okay. Uh, can you give us an example of a case where the lack of public engagement led to less good decision-making politically? Well, I think one of the, the big examples is uh, the, the health of water in the Great Lakes. You know, it's, it's our biggest resource. And it's incredibly important to the economic and social health of Ontario, Quebec, and several U.S. states. But it's almost too big a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the cities have become organized. And I was chair with Mayor Daly, founding chair, co-chair of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative very organized. 
but people, it's almost as if the issue is too big. So people, there's some examples of people doing very good work, but organizing people all around the lake hasn't really happened. And I, I think, you know, the results from that, the cities around the Great Lakes spend, I don't have the exact figure, but it's something like $4 billion a year on water cleanup measures. The federal government spends something like $4 million. Um, <laughs> And it's, you know, it should be the other way around, because right? uh, the, the, the federal government has, has most of the tax revenues in this country. And I, I think that's a result of the fact of people not being directly engaged in the issues. Okay. Um, taking a look at Stop the Drop, with which you are somewhat familiar, um, what role do you think it can play in dealing with that and that specific issue of lack of engagement around water? And what are the pitfalls we might want to try and avoid? Well, I think what Stop the Drop can offer is a way to help people be engaged on a really critical issue right now, which is um, the low water levels creating serious environmental and economic challenges, uh, particularly in Georgian Bay. Um, it goes a bit beyond Georgian Bay, but that's a very important place. You know, as the water levels decline, the, the wetlands aren't working properly, which has a direct impact on water quality. Simple things like Municipalities having to build new pipes you know, for, for water plants, very expensive. Um, recreational cottages uh, being left high and dry. All sorts of direct economic impacts and very serious environmental impacts. And I think uh, having being able to reach out through a, in a virtual way to everybody, whether they're cottagers, permanent residents, people in the fishing industry, municipal governments, all around Georgian Bay is really important. Um, and it's a really important part of organizing. And the second thing is that this campaign will have going for it um, that uh, perhaps Occupy didn't is a clear goal, mm -hmm. science-based, clear goal, clear message. So some people may only want to send an email, some people may only want to phone, others may want to do more, but Stop the Drop becomes a tool to allow that uh, self-organizing to be far more effective. And in terms of pitfalls, what, what can go wrong if you try and do this kind of thing? Uh, is it just a matter of getting a lot of people? I mean, you've talked about organization and a clear ask. Are there any other things that can go wrong? Well, I, I think it's important to uh, bring people on side, um, other organizations that might be doing similar work. And you know, I think it's also important to, to think fairly carefully about the political ask, because in this case, it's not just money. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a far more complicated ask. Um, but it's important to ask it with clarity. So if the ask is uh, we need to deal with the dredging of the St. Clair River, for example, it's a very clear ask. If the ask is we need Ottawa and Queen's Park to give X billion, it's a clear but different ask. And I think some real thought has to be given into how that ask is, is made. Because ultimately you're organizing to make change. And you're organizing because it's not change that people can make on their own. You know, it doesn't matter how good a job or how much money somebody has who lives on Georgian Bay or has a cottage there, they can't solve the St. Clair River dredging problem by themselves. We can only do it collectively and with the assistance of our, our national and provincial governments. So um, I, I think you know, that's, that's the challenge, making sure everybody's aligned, different organizations are working together, and I think Stop the, Trump, Stop the Drop is a good tool to be able to do that. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Pleasure. Good luck. Thanks.